Hello and welcome back to Be A Loser. We've been discussing some of the benefits of fasting in the last few videos of this series. Now some of the most life-altering diseases that one can be diagnosed with are neurodegenerative disorders. I think many of us live in fear of being told that we will at some point lose control of our mental faculties and become either mentally or physically impaired or both. The toll that these diseases can take on us and our loved ones is immense. Now, we've already discussed autophagy and its many, many health benefits, but if you want a refresher, you can head back and rewatch that video. One of those benefits was the possibility of preventing these neurodegenerative disorders. I'm sure this is of interest to many people, so let's continue the list of benefits and discuss how fasting can help prevent and possibly reverse Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative diseases. Of the estimated 5.5 million Americans living with Alzheimer's disease in 2017, an estimated 5.3 million are age 65 and older, and approximately 200,000 individuals are under age 65 and have younger onset Alzheimer's. One in 10 people age 65 and older has Alzheimer's disease. That's 10% of people over age 65 in the US. Almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. Now, because of the increasing number of people age 65 and older in the United States, the number of new cases of Alzheimer's and other dementias is projected to soar. Today, someone in the United States develops Alzheimer's every 66 seconds. By mid-century, this will increase to every 33 seconds. Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. It's the fifth leading cause of death among those age 65 and older. Between 2000 and 2014, deaths from Alzheimer's disease increased 89%, while deaths from the number one cause of death, heart disease, decreased 14%. Among people age 70, 61% of those with Alzheimer's are expected to die before the age of 80, compared with 30% of people without Alzheimer's. That's twice the number of deaths related to Alzheimer's. In 2016, 15.9 million family and friends provided 18.2 billion hours of unpaid assistance to those with Alzheimer's and other dementias. That's an enormous toll on friends and loved ones. Total annual payments for health care long-term care and hospice care for people with Alzheimer's or other dementias currently cost the United States $259 billion and are projected to increase to more than $1.1 trillion in 2050. So what I hope is very apparent is that Alzheimer's is not a trivial disease and something that bears closer understanding and intervention. So let's start by trying to understand the markers and potential causes of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease AD is characterized by the abnormal accumulation of proteins in the brain. There are two main classes, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles known as tau protein. It's believed that these abnormal proteins destroy the synaptic connections in the memory and cognition areas of the brain. Now, as we discussed in my autophagy video, it's the hormone glucagon that allows for autophagy to be activated. However, the process, as are all body processes, is much more complicated than that. So let's look a bit deeper at the process of autophagy, how it's controlled, and how its benefits to preventing neurodegenerative disorders go beyond just AD. In a multicelled organism, it's difficult to synchronize the availability of nutrients and growth signaling. If we look at a human being, we already know that we're designed to live for long periods without food, longer than most realize. We're sustained by the stored food energy in our body fat. When food isn't available, our bodies don't want to grow, and therefore we require nutrient sensors which are directly connected to growth pathways. 
The main three sensors are mTOR, AMPK, and insulin, with which, if you follow my videos, we are intimately acquainted. Now, when these nutrient sensors detect that nutrients are low, they tell our cells to stop growing and start breaking down unnecessary parts. This, as we know, is autophagy. But here's what's important. If we have a disease of excessive growth, like Alzheimer's disease, then we can reduce this excess growth by activating the aforementioned nutrient sensors. The main regulator of autophagy is the target of rapamycin kinase, which was originally discovered in yeast. It was later also discovered in humans and then referred to as mechanistic TOR or mTOR. When mTOR goes up, it shuts off autophagy. It's very sensitive to dietary amino acids, aka protein. mTOR is found in virtually all multicellular organisms and indeed many single celled organisms. As I said, it was first discovered in yeast, and that's where much of the research on autophagy is done. This protein is so important to survival that no organism alive functions without it. mTOR is the main nutrient sensor for autophagy. It combines signals from insulin, nutrients, and the fuel gauge of the cell, AMPK, which we'll discuss in a moment. Now, mTOR then determines whether the cell should divide and grow or become dormant. Excess nutrients, not just carbohydrates, may stimulate the mTOR system and thus turn off autophagy. This encourages growth of cells. Having cells growing as an adult is generally not healthy. As I just mentioned, the other regulator of autophagy is AMPK, AMP activated protein kinase. This is a sensor of energy within the cells. This energy is known as adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. When the cell has a lot of energy stored up, it has a lot of ATP. This means that the cells have a lot of energy available to use. AMPK detects the AMP to ATP ratio, and when the ratio is high, meaning that the cells are low on energy, then the AMPK is activated. When AMPK is high, this shuts down de novo lipogenesis, or fat production, and activates autophagy. And this makes sense. If your cells are low on energy, then we don't want to store energy as fat. Instead, we want to activate autophagy and generate more energy through free fatty acids. Now, metformin, a drug widely used in type 2 diabetes, also activates autophagy, but not through mTOR. It increases AMPK. High AMPK levels directly and indirectly activate autophagy, but also mitochondrial production. Now, a mitochondrion is an organelle found in large numbers in most cells, in which the biochemical processes of respiration and energy production occur. Mitophagy is the selective targeting of defective or dysfunctional mitochondrion. These are the parts of the cell that produce the energy. If these aren't working properly, then the process of mitophagy targets them for destruction. AMPK will stimulate mitophagy, as well as new mitochondrion growth. Essentially, it's replacing old mitochondrion with new ones. Once autophagy is activated by either decreasing mTOR or increasing AMPK, then certain genes are activated to carry out the cleaning process and prevent damage and misfolding of the tau and amyloid proteins, which as you recall are a major factor in AD. Now, one of the cleansing proteins is known as HSP70. In mouse models, Alternate day fasting or a 36 hour fasting regimen increased the levels of HSP70. Mice maintained on IF compared to normal mice showed less age related deterioration of neurons and fewer symptoms in models of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and Huntington's disease. In humans, the benefit to the brain can be found both during fasting and caloric restriction, CR. During exercise in CR, there is increased synaptic and electrical activity in the brain. In a study of 50 normal elderly subjects, memory test improved significantly with three months of CR, 30% reduction in calories. Aging rats were started on intermittent fasting regimens and greatly improved their scores of motor coordination and cognitive tests. Learning and memory scores also improved after IF. There were increased brain connectivity and new neuron growth 
from stem cells through a process known as neurogenesis. This is believed to be controlled, at least in part, by brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. BDNF acts on some neurons in the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system and helps the already existing neurons to survive. Additionally, it encourages the growth of new neurons and synapses. Higher levels of BDNF lead to healthier neurons and better communication between them. Low levels of BDNF are linked to dementia, Alzheimer's, memory loss, and other brain processing problems. Intermittent fasting up to 36 hours, or ADF, alternate day fasting, has been shown to boost BDNF levels by up to 400%. Levels of fasting insulin seem to be inversely connected to memory as well. That is to say, the lower one's fasting insulin, the more improvement in memory score that's seen. Elevated circulating levels of insulin reduce the amount of neural autophagy and cause metabolic problems as well as accelerated degenerative states. There's also substantial evidence that risk of AD is related to obesity. A recent study demonstrated that weight gain in middle age predisposes to AD. Using detailed measurements of blood flow to the brain, researchers linked a higher BMI to decreased blood flow to those areas of the brain involved in attention, reasoning, and higher brain function. Intermittent fasting provides one method of decreasing insulin while also decreasing caloric intake. Thus, it's possible that IF may prevent the development of Alzheimer's disease as well. Regular intermittent fasting is essential for the brain to clean itself up and drive new neurons and communication lines for optimal function. Fasting improves brain function as there is less clutter blocking healthy neurological function in the brain. Now, besides intermittent fasting, yet another dietary intervention that may be of particular importance for those with Alzheimer's, as well as Parkinson's, is the ketogenic diet, an extreme form of LCHF. One 2006 study suggests that a diet high in fat, around 90%, and very limited in protein and carbohydrates has neuroprotective effects in both Parkinson's and Alzheimer's sufferers. While this was an, obviously an extreme form of ketogenic diet, when used on patients with Parkinson's disease, it resulted in improvements in balance, tremors, and mood. Now, there are various theories as to how it helps, including shifting your brain's metabolism from blood sugar to ketone bodies. For more information about LCHF diets, including ketogenic diets, please check out my LCHF series. Now, your heart, as well as other muscles, operate quite efficiently when fueled by ketones. Your muscles can store more glucose as glycogen than your brain because they have an enzyme that helps them maintain their glycogen stores. But your brain actually lacks this enzyme, so it prefers to be fueled by glucose. When your blood glucose levels are falling, your ketone levels are typically rising, and vice versa. So, you might be wondering then, how your brain is able to function when you're in a state of ketosis. And it turns out that your body has a mechanism pro for providing your brain with a fuel source it can use when glucose is in short supply. So when your glucose is low, your brain tells your liver to produce a ketone-like compound called beta-hydroxybutyrate. This compound is able to fuel your brain very efficiently, especially once adapted either through fasting or LCHF, or ideally both. The more efficient your body is at burning stored fat, the more easily it can move seamlessly between its fat burning and carbohydrate burning states. Eliminating excess sugar and grains from your diet will help you adapt your body to burn stored fat for fuel. Typically, restricting your carbohydrates to 30 or 40 grams per day, along with a moderate amount of protein, is enough to adapt your body into ketosis. Intermittent fasting will also activate ketosis on a daily basis, which removes fat and the brain then thrives on ketones. Exercising, particularly while fasting, is also very effective for jumpstarting your fat adaptation. The more consistently you exercise, the better your body will be at using your own fat stores for energy. So how do we use fasting to prevent or possibly reverse AD? Well, ideally you want to fast for a minimum of 16 hours per day, 
so feeding at lunch and until 6 p.m. Otherwise, water or teas with no sweeteners. If you can add a 23-hour fast, meaning one meal per day, the results should be greatly increased. Start your day by drinking 32 ounces of water with a pinch of salt. Yes, I said salt. You want to avoid keto flu or any other side effects. You can find more tips for this in my LCHF series as well as earlier in this series. Now that you've had your water and salt, go for a 45 minute walk three to four times per week. If possible, include swimming or some other water activity. And get interactive with other people as talking with someone can increase synaptic sensitivity. Try to replace added sugars and refined carbs with healthier foods like blueberries, walnuts, and pecans. Higher water content fruit like watermelon is especially good for the brain. A lot of time, Alzheimer's patients have been living on soda and other unhealthy processed foods for their entire life. Even in nursing homes, the nutritional drinks that are administered are often full of sugars and other additives. People tend to drink less and less water and thus become increasingly dehydrated over time. Since the brain has such a high water content, this can take a toll on mental health and can potentially lead to Alzheimer's. Now, when initially trying a fasting regimen, be sure to start slow. Mark Matson, a professor of neuroscience at the John Hopkins School of Medicine says, the analogy with exercise applies here as well. If you've been sedentary, and then all of a sudden you try to run five miles, it's not very pleasant, and you'll likely get discouraged. It's the same thing as if you've been eating three meals a day plus snacks, and then you're not eating anything at all for two days. You're not going to like it. Now, Matson suggests easing into the routine by starting with one day of moderate fasting per week and then building up to two and so on and so forth. There will likely be a week or two of headaches, lightheadedness and or grouchiness, which are common side effects. But after the initial phase, experiments show that your mood should pick up. Again, for a better understanding of intermittent fasting, be sure to watch or rewatch this fasting series. I cover all the basics as well as tips and recommendations for making fasting easier as well as more efficient. So I suppose the question you must ask yourself is that if you're at risk of AD or are currently suffering from AD, Parkinson's or some other neurodegenerative disorder, or if someone you love is suffering from them, then isn't it worth at least trying the simple life change of intermittent fasting? If the result could be reducing or eliminating your risk of AD or Parkinson's, or even potentially reversing the effects of these debilitating diseases without drugs and with no real side effects, then what is there to lose really? As always, the answer is ultimately up to you. So, if you're new to the channel, please subscribe and enable alerts so you don't miss when new videos are uploaded. And of course, I'd love it if you would like the videos and share them so we can continue to get more exposure for the channel and the information on it. Let's see if we can make this the most liked video on the channel. I'm going to challenge all my losers out there to see if we can get 250 likes on this video as I believe it's important to many, many people who are suffering or have loved ones suffering from these debilitating diseases. As always, I want to thank you so much for watching. And until next time, keep being a loser.